So welcome to the Compounding Center Connections, where we talk about different health conditions with our partnered practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we partner with practitioners, create custom medications to help our patients get better. In this episode, we have Dr. Ian Harrison from Harrison Equine in Berryville, Virginia. So we're going to be talking today about horses and a debilitating disease that they get called equine protozoal myoencephalitis, also called EPM. So welcome, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. So could you uh, introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your practice. Uh, uh, and share some insight. Well, I've been an equine surgeon for more years than I can remember. I think it's about 42 years. And I'm getting feedback from my son, who's now in Melbourne, going to the same school I went to, which is a lot of fun. Um, And I'm trying to provide affordable, realistic equine care for people with their horses, because in some cases it becomes uh, economically... uh, not feasible for them to continue with some animals. So I think the big, the big thing is to have a realistic approach to all these diseases that we're trading. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, before we begin uh, a, a, a disclaimer, the information discussed today uh, is for informational purposes only, not for diagnosis or treatment. Um, so let's get started. Um, so Dr. Harrison, um, you know, uh, we compound medications here for EPM, and, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know a whole lot about horses, but I know they are, uh, they weigh a thousand pounds and their doses are uh, in grams. So um, could you tell us what is EPM and how do horses get it? Well, as you said, uh, equine protozoal myeloencephalitis is a disease horses get from ingesting a parasite from a possum, possibly a cat. It's a protozoan parasite that they get from an aberrant species. And when the parasite gets into the horse, it decides it's sort of lost and migrates around until it finds their spinal cord and migrates aberrantly, you know, around in the spinal cord, causing all sorts of neurologic disease. And it's a real problem um, in this area because we have all of the the vectors necessary. We've got possums and skunks and cats and all sorts of vectors that can carry this protozoa from um, from their area to the horses. That now the horses don't get infected from another horse. It's they're a dead end host, so it's purely contamination from all of these ho- intermediate hosts that we're, we're still discovering. Got you. So. Uh, uh... Am I to understand, or would you say uh, this is uh, all across the U.S., uh, any horses uh, across the U.S., or is it mostly on the East Coast? Or um... it's, all across, it's all across the U.S., and the incidence of disease has been looked at as far as looking at antibody levels in horses, and it corresponds pretty closely to what vectors are around to carry the bug. And in this area, for example, um, they found that uh, 86% of normal horses will have antibodies to this particular bug, one of the three that can, can cause EPM. And it's a, it can be either a psychocystis, a, a neospora, or an, even a toxoplasma bug from cats. Gotcha. So uh, how does an owner um, kind of, like, what is an owner, uh, the signs and symptoms that do they kind of, talk to you about and bring the horse in like what are the signs of system that you know you suspect okay i should bring the horse in it could be in uh uh, an epm situation well the the um, progressive ones that actually have signs of ataxia and they can't walk properly they got muscle atrophy they they're fairly straightforward but for owners it's difficult because these animals can present with all sorts of strange signs like a sudden sudden change in behaviour, uh, dramatic difference when they were riding the horse. That horse can't be ridden downhill very well. It goes uphill fine. 
Um, there's even some new evidence showing that some of these horses have episodes of choke that nobody can diagnose. Yeah. But the big thing is that there's so many different presenting signs. The most important part of the diagnosis is talking with the veterinarian and the owner knows more about the horse than I do every time. So by discussing all these factors with them, they can tell you things that have changed. And it's a change that occurs generally in muscle mass. And it's always, they say it's multifocal, which means it can affect any part of the brain or, or spinal cord. And it's always asymmetric. It's, there's always one side that's worse than the other. Most sort of central nervous system neurologic diseases will present with similar signs on both sides of the body. But that's the classic for EPM is you have a neurologic deficit that's worse on one side than the other and muscle atrophy or sweating or lameness that's worse on one side than the other. So this is why it's very important to discuss with the owners, how have you noticed this horse changing over the past few months? I was not aware of that. That was, it's asymmetrical. Hmm. Um, how, like how common or how prevalent is EPM? Uh, like at least in our area here in Virginia to perhaps the East coast. Can you talk about that? Do you know any numbers or statistics? Well, most of the East coast, as I said, the, the, um, the antibody studies show that 86% of normal horses have been in contact with the bug but only about 5% of those horses actually get the disease. Hmm. And that's the part that we really don't understand very well at the moment is what sort of stress is imposed on these animals that makes them susceptible to this bug getting into their, into their spinal cord. Could be allergies, could be fever, could be other diseases, could be all sorts of reasons that maybe there's a big stress factor involved because of the low incidence of the disease compared with the high incidence of antibodies. Gotcha. So uh, uh, when an owner brings in uh, a horse to you, not only are, are you looking at uh, the atrophy of the muscles, uh, but are, do you have any tests also that you can do uh, to diagnose this condition? Are there any tests available? There's certainly plenty of tests available. And some of them are a little debatable at the moment. We can certainly, you know, take a, get a blood sample, look at antibody levels. And I prefer to send the antibody levels to UC Davis because they have a system that to me is very, very accurate. Now, the, the good thing about, the good and bad thing about the test is that, as I said, 86% of normal horses have antibodies, but the negative test is very specific. So that if you have a horse that you test and is negative, there's probably only about a 5% chance that he's actually got the disease. So it certainly helps okay. rule out the disease. It's worthwhile at least getting a negative response because there's no, um, there's no direct correlation between severity of disease and levels of antibodies. Now, there was a whole program that people went through where they decided that we should be doing CSF taps, getting CSF samples from these horses. Um, and comparing antibody levels in the CSF in the, from the, the spinal cord and the blood. And now there's even more studies that show if the horse has had a fever over 103, has been exposed to influenza virus, all sorts of other reasons, you'll get leakage of antibodies into the spinal cord and your, the CSF will then also test positive. So now you've got to work, do a, you know, we can do a CSF tap quite easily now with under ultrasound guided uh, C2, C3 C on the side of their neck. But when you look at a lot of the cases, the incredible expense involved in doing all these diagnostic tests, what you need to know is the horse negative. If he's not, the clinical signs support EPM and often the treatment can be part of the diagnosis because there's really no downside to the treatment. So gotcha. yeah, it, it seems a little, I've had situations where it's cost owners so much money to diagnose the disease, they were unable to afford the treatment for the horse. So um, we don't want to get into that situation. Well, since you brought up treatments, um, can you uh, talk to us about what, uh, you know, what are some common treatments available out there? Well, the, 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 re the registered treatments that are approved by the FDA are marquee, which is Ponazaril. That's okay. um, a 
paste medication that actually kills the protozoa. Um, and protozil is a, a pelleted medication that is a, that's um, a diclazaril that is actually um, you, fed daily as a pelleted part of their feed. Okay. And also there's another compound called rebalance, which is trimethylam sulfur and pyrimethamine, um, which the one problem is that that's only a uh, protozoal static drug. It's not really a protozoal cidal drug. The first two drugs kill the bug. This drug, the rebalance drug, sort of stops it from reproducing. So the animal still has to mount a good immune response to kill the, to kill the bug. And when you look back at the history, there's a really interesting concept with that particular drug that it was used in a specific area in California where they were treating EPM that happened to have come from cats. So it was toxoplasma. Toxoplasma is much more sensitive to the rebalance. So maybe it's not really a, a drug based on the overall North American population. So maybe it doesn't do quite as well. Now, there's a, also a drug that we tend to use quite frequently, which is um, Toltrazeril in DMSO. The studies were done at Michigan State University where they showed combining Toltrazeril with the DMSO greatly enhanced the absorption. Because if you look at some of the, the drugs, maybe 60% of them are absorbed orally and the DMSO compounding really makes a big difference to um, help these horses get over the disease. So um, uh, is it uh, uh, appropriate to say that you can uh, cure EPM because it is uh, cytal or that kills the protozoa? Um, I, think, I think you can, yes. I think there's a lot of, we have a lot of horses in our practice and a lot of horses across North America that have been completely treated and the, and the disease eliminated in, with one treatment. Now, yeah, there's too. certainly a lot of evidence to show that maybe about 8% of horses that have EPM and are being treated will have a relapse maybe 90 days after they've been successfully treated. And a lot of that is related to their, their immune response to the bug or the stress or the, we just, there's still so much to learn about this particular disease. Okay. So a horse can have a relapse of this yes. Yes. disease. Okay. Um, now, um, you had mentioned three, uh, three drugs, uh, and do you, uh, uh, how do you decide which one to use or do you rotate them or, um, uh, how do you decide which one to go with? It's, uh, well, personal preference based on doing this for years, the drug that I tend to use is Toltrazeril and DMSO because I found it to be most reliable. Okay. Um, there's no, you don't need to rotate the different drugs. And there's certainly um, evidence now that shows that one of the drugs, Protozil, um, may be better to be used as a preventative. It might be going to be a preventative in the future because its success rate for treatment is not as high as was originally anticipated. But studies done up in New Jersey with standard bred yearlings have shown that low doses of protozil can, might be able to prevent the animals getting the disease. But of wow. course, we go back to the, the other problem that the way the FDA regulations are organized, a lot of the drug companies aren't gonna go back and try and re-register this drug for a preventative because that's going to cost them, you know, 11 or $12 yeah. million. Same thing with the, you know, gastro guard and ulcer guard. They had to go through the whole studies twice so they could say one was a preventative and one was a treatment because the FDA won't allow them to say both for one product. But I think there's a lot of evidence to show that protozil is an, a valuable preventative, especially in these animals that have a recurrence. So you treat them successfully and maintain them on, uh, a very small dose twice a week of, of protozoa. Now you had mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, you want to bring affordable treatment uh, to your um, equine owners. And are these medications, uh, if they're going to be on it long-term, um, I, I don't know the pricing since they're not a compounded medication. Are they quite affordable uh, uh, medications? Well, the Toltrazeril and DMSO is quite a, an affordable medication for owners. A month's treatment, I think, is going to be in the neighborhood of $170 or $180. Okay, and gotcha. And the other products are much more expensive. But with Protozil, as I said, 
The protozil is about, I'm, I'm only guessing, I think it's around $600 for a bucket of protozil, which was designed for a 28 day treatment. If you use the preventative treatment of half a scoop on Mondays and Thursdays, then that $600 bucket will last you 28 weeks instead of 28 days. So okay. it certainly does become affordable. Sure, sure. Now, um, are there any, uh, it seems like, you know, uh, we have the immune system that's involved that's trying to keep this uh, bug at bay. Uh, and are there any other uh, therapies that you include with these treatments that kind of boost the immune system up at the same time? So there's the only, no relapse? Okay. Yeah. Well, the only treatment that we found that does seem to help a little based on studies done in cows at Colorado State University is we try using uh, levamisole, which is a wormer that uh -huh. was used in cattle that does seem to stimulate their immune response. Um, also, as part of the treatment, we make sure that they get vitamin E supplementation because vitamin E is very important in helping remyelination of the, of the nerves. But because we don't quite understand the specific, the, well, there are no specific T cell um, drugs that will enhance that T cell, the, the immune response in horses. But I have to admit, after doing some a little studying, um, teaching some courses at Shenandoah, uh, that the fact that we now have a vaccine available for human malaria shows that it's exactly the same mechanism and the same um, uh, bug, the same sort of protozoa attacks people in the same way that get malaria, that this bug attacks these horses. So you, you have to be cautiously optimistic. There will be a big step in the vaccine market soon that should actually be based upon the studies done for malaria. Got you. Well, uh, now you brought up teaching and Shenandoah University. So remind me to come back to that and ask you a little bit more about that. Um, sure. Now, uh, you know, how about, uh, do you recommend any nutritional supplements or different kind of, different kind of feeds perhaps uh, for horses with this condition? Other than ensuring they have uh, very uh, high levels of vitamin E, it has to be like 10,000 international units per day is the level that we would like to see them getting uh, as part of the recovery process. The other thing in, with horses that we've all got to be conscious of is when it comes to feeding these horses, we want to try and make their feed program as boring as possible. They get fed the same sort of thing at the same time every day because any sort of low grade change or stress in the difference in, for example, in the amount of carbohydrate they get can produce changes in, the, in their colon mucosa that allows them to absorb things that they shouldn't. And they can end up with all sorts of other sort of stress related problems. You've uh, unintentionally introduced the stress by suddenly changing their feed stuff. So I think the big, most important thing is to try and make their feed programs as boring as possible. Don't change them. And if you've got to change different sorts of hay or different sorts of grain, change it over a few days. And then as you avoid all these stresses, because there's no doubt that stress is a significant part of them developing EPM. Gotcha. Well, now uh, um, let's go back to... Uh the teaching at Shenandoah University. Could you tell us a little bit more of what, uh, uh, what you're doing at Shenandoah University? I'm actually thoroughly enjoying it, to be honest. And uh, they've asked me to start to help them develop a pre-vet program. They want to have a course there for students to come in and, and study to be able to go on to be get selected for veterinary medicine. Uh, ah. and, and they also want to have a big focus on animal welfare, animal physiology, because there's so many courses these days where and so many um so many jobs out in the animal welfare field that people sort of need the extra education on how does how do animals compare with people that's fine yeah, I do. Well, I thoroughly enjoy well, it. well dr harrison quite commendable that now you're teaching and sharing your knowledge with uh the young and upcoming uh you know uh veterinarians and or who want to get into the veterinary equine veterinary field um, that's awesome. Um, I'm learning to uh, stay two pages ahead of them. What was that? I'm learning to stay two pages ahead of them in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anything else that perhaps we missed uh, on this particular condition that you'd like to share with owners or um, anything else you'd like to share? 
Well, I think that the biggest thing with EPM is don't limit yourself to thinking that these horses will all show some sort of ataxia, some sort of they'll get wobbly and weak, and I know what it is, I'll come in and get them treated. The, the, so a couple of recent studies now, as I was saying that many horses, they're finding that have had some sort of um, esophageal abnormalities or maybe have choked a few times in their history, They've had the opportunity to do postmortems on horses that have not never been diagnosed with EPM. They've had a history of having choke, and they've found um, sarcocystis cysts in the esophagus. So even something as simple as an occasional choke or an occasional problem swallowing, anything that you've noticed that's a change in your horse's normal behaviour, go and talk to your veterinarian and see what they can help you with. Great. So sounds like. Um... Discuss it with a veterinarian and early detection is uh, be very helpful for the lifespan of the horse. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, Dr. Harrison, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you've shared a lot of good information with us. And uh, how could someone reach out to you uh, for questions or more information? Uh, uh, the easiest way is our clinic phone number, 540-955-3001. There will be someone there to help you anytime you call. Awesome. And I'll make sure that I put the uh, website address and the uh, phone number in the show notes. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning into the Compounding Center Connections podcast. We hope you found the information presented to you today to be helpful. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to me at jay at compoundingcenter.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast channel, The Compounding Center Connections. And stay tuned for future episodes.